Since the advent of the news cameraman in the earlier part of this century, we have become accustomed to seeing dramatic scenes unfold throughout the world as we watch in the comfort and safety of the cinemas and our own homes. We have seen history in the making as the events that have shaped our lives have been caught on camera as they happen. Who can ever forget the images of seeing the Wright brothers take the air for the first time, or watching Blériot cross the channel? Many will remember the vision of Lindbergh landing in Paris. Many more will remember the day when the first man flew in space, or the moment when the first human being set foot on the moon. These were all great moments, captured forever on film. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But alongside those momentous images, we have also seen many dramatic scenes of a more somber nature. The trenches of the First World War, the bombed out towns and cities of Europe in the Second World War, the attack on Pearl Harbor, Hiroshima. All these names conjure up stark images that we've all seen at one time or another. The jungles of Vietnam, the deserts on fire in Kuwait. War has always been an excellent provider of compelling news reads. Can you remember the day or where you were when President Kennedy was shot dead in Dallas? Or the day the Iranian embassy was stormed by the SAS in London? We have also seen many disasters as they occur throughout the world. Natural disasters, floods devastating whole towns, earthquakes ripping apart cities, volcanoes erupting and spilling their molten ash over anything that happens to be in the way. We have watched awestruck as trains have crashed. Our aircraft have collided and broken apart in the skies in front of our eyes. Sometimes the outcome has been tragic. Other times the passengers were more lucky and escaped unhurt. We have seen bridges tear themselves apart in high winds. Grandstands collapse at sporting events. Buildings have burned to the ground as the cameras have continued to turn. Even on the high seas, we have watched great ships and liners of the world, such as the Titanic, go down to a watery grave. Wherever and whenever dramatic scenes have occurred, the news camera has always been there. Sometimes during the event, sometimes immediately after. This is the story of one such scene that was recorded as it actually happened. A tragic last act of a drama that was played out in front of the world, and a scene that was witnessed by several newsmen, and one that has become one of the most shocking images ever recorded. The demise of the Hindenburg.
When the Hindenburg exploded in a ball of flame in May 1937, not only was it a great tragedy for all those that died, but also for the airship industry. The lighter-than-airship had, for almost three decades, been the king of the skies, transporting passengers in absolute luxury from one part of the globe to another. Now this fiery disaster had brought the airship era to an untimely end. The cause of the accident has never been confirmed, although many theories have been put forward, including the possibility of sabotage. There had been a spate of bomb threats previous to the flight, and Dr. Hugo Eckener, the ship's designer, was renowned for his opposition to his Zeppelin being used for Nazi propaganda, something which had infuriated Goebbels himself, and enough for him to denounce Eckener publicly. Another important factor to consider has to be that the Hindenburg was held aloft by highly inflammable hydrogen gas. Whereas the American airships and today's modern-day non-Richard airships use non-flammable helium gas. Ironically, the Hindenburg had originally been designed to use helium. Although there is no record of any such request being given to the Americans who were the only suppliers of helium at that time. The Hindenburg was a rigid airship almost the size of the Titanic. Today's modern airships are much, much smaller and are dwarf-like by comparison. But riding through the skies in a lighter-than-airship such as this one run by the famous Goodyear Company, one gains just an inkling of how it must have felt to have flown in a Zeppelin like the Hindenburg. The only difference with this particular airship is, or this type of airship, how come we have beyond 14 of these things, uh, is that it's, it's a non-rigid airship, which means there's no frame in it. The Germans, the old airship, they had big frames, metal frames in them, which weighed and, you know, uh, uh, but they, they were rigid airships, which, to a certain extent, you know, uh, is more involved. Uh, this, this thing's just blown up with helium, inflated with helium, and uh, as I say, if there's no helium in there, you lose controllability and the thing won't fly. Although the rigid Zeppelins were much bigger by comparison, the basic principles of flying them were not too different. With the trim wheel, basically you move, if you move the trim wheel back, you move the elevators up at the back of the tunnel and tail, so it pushes the tail down, the nose up, and if you move the elevators with the trim wheel forward, it moves the elevators at the back down, and it pushes the tail up and the nose down, so as I say, like, like an aircraft, and then you've got the rudder pedals like in a boat or like an aircraft, if you want to go to the left, you just push your left foot forward, and it's fairly manoeuvrable, as you saw earlier on. It's, it's quite manoeuvrable, isn't it? And uh, vice versa, you want to go to the right, push your right foot forward. As, as with the boat, it moves the rudder to the right of the back, pushes the tail round to the left, and push your left foot forward, pushing the tail round to the right. So you can uh, do your turns with that. And the speed is controlled with these two power levers over here. You've got two power levers, just like aircraft have in the middle, and they control the, the RPM of the two engines that we've got here. They're German Limbach engines. The, the basic principle is that the, the airship is held up, we're held up there uh, by, by the use of helium, 68,000 cubic feet of helium is actually carrying the weight and this helium is, because it's so much lighter than air, it's actually carrying it so we don't need wings or anything like that. The only thing is we need to get up and down and to do that we actually point the airship up and force it up with the engines and point it down and force it down with the engines because the, the helium is not going to, it can't change to give us more lift or less lift at any stage during the flight. It's there and that's it. It carries a certain amount of uh, weight and that's it. You know? So we need to think about the rest and basically get the thing up and down. Um, the the lift, lift capability of the helium does, does change with temperature and altitude. If you get, like for instance, the more helium you get, the more it's going to carry. And if it heats up, because the, the sun's heating the, the stuff up, then you're going to get more helium and carry more weight. So we have to control that in flight and we take what we do there is we, uh, we control the pressure with a ballonet. That's full of air. If the helium pressure reduces, we pump air into the bag. And if it increases, we let air out of the bag. So we control the helium pressure with that plastic bag. Let pump air into it, we'll let air out of it. Otherwise, the ship's uh, equipped, the same as an airliner, basically. We've got satellite navigation, we've got uh, radar, we've got two boxes, one for the air traffic people, one for the ground crew. All the instruments are the same as in an aircraft, except for these two, they're helium pressure instruments. It would seem that lighter than airships are relatively safe to operate.
Even the landing technique used today is still the same as it would have been for the Hindenburg on that fateful day. Just as the Goodyear ship comes in for its final approach, after circling the landing field, it drops its landing lines to the waiting ground crew, who in turn halt the airship by pulling it down with the ropes. It is then towed to the mast, which holds fast the airship's nose, while still allowing the tethered airship free movement in the wind direction. Could the landing have been the cause of the accident? The story of the airship begins in the late 1700s. The French Montgolfier brothers made the very first recorded ascent in a balloon made from paper in 1783. Heated air forced into the balloon created the lift necessary to carry a man. The first flight across the English Channel was also made by a Frenchman, Jean-Pierre Blanchard, in 1793. Ballooning became a very popular pastime in the 19th century. Balloons were even used as spies in the sky during the American Civil War and the Franco-Prussian War. Napoleon had used balloons over the battlefield at Waterloo. In 1897, the inventor Schwarz created, way ahead of its time, an aluminium contraption which was technically the world's first rigid airship. But the real grandfather of the airship industry has to be Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. Zeppelin had served as a balloon observer during the American Civil War. And he was the founder of the famous Zeppelin Company, a name that became legendary throughout the world as the builder of rigid airships. Based on his experience with balloons, Zeppelin came up with the idea of a rigid ship that housed a number of individual balloons or compartments. The idea was based on the same principle that shipbuilders use, the loss of buoyancy being minimalized in the event of damage. The framework was made up with a number of transverse frames, made from aluminium to reduce weight as much as possible, and these were braced with wires. Zeppelin's first practical rigid flew on July the 2nd, 1900 the LZ-1. Vertical control was achieved by the ingenious use of a suspended sliding weight with Count von Zeppelin at the wheel. The 416 foot long cylinder slowly rose from Lake Constance for a flight that was to last for 18 minutes. The airship was born. Although many others tried to emulate von Zeppelin's success, rival airships were never big enough or fast enough to be considered anything more than playthings compared to those that the Count had in mind. He had launched the second of his great ships, and later that year, the third one. Zeppelin was now, by far, the leader in a great international race in airship building. Zeppelin's early airships were operated from floating docks which automatically weather vaned into the wind. But operating on water was not easy and this gave way to land-based hangars being constructed. The doors proved to be one of the toughest problems to overcome. As when they were opened, they formed huge wind breakers which resulted in them bending. Some hangars therefore were constructed in canvas with open fronts. Zeppelin gathered one of the strongest teams of workers, notably Dr. Hugo Eckener. Dr. Ludwig Dürr, responsible for many of Zeppelin's unique and important engineering features. And Dr. Carl Einstein, who continued building many airships in the United States of America. Zeppelin became so popular in Germany that when his airship LZ-4 crashed, leaving the company on the brink of bankruptcy, donations poured in from all over the country from people rich and poor. Over six million marks. The Count's dream had become a national dream. It was in this house that von Zeppelin spent many of his earlier years and where he developed his ideas. In 1908, he founded the first passenger airship company, which still exists to this very day. His granddaughter, 
Baroness Alexa von Koenig Warthausen lived there until she died in 1997. She remembers her grandfather well. This furniture was previously located in his castle. My grandfather Zeppelin designed the construction of his airships on this desk. This was the original furniture from his room. This chair, however, wasn't from his room, but from one of his airships. This is the only one remaining. You can see these chairs in many of the old photographs. In America, my grandfather was in his youth. He took part in the civil war as a balloonist. He brought the ideas he then had back to Germany. He was always good at motivating those around him. He shared his ideals and everyone wanted to help him. They all loved my grandfather and would do anything for him. The country loved him. He would just tell his workers what he wanted done and keep them motivated until the job was finished. But even when he had some genius idea, he would always let them improve on it or have their input. He would never dictate what they must or must not do. When he asked the designers if they could build an engine lighter than the Mercedes, they just went ahead and built one. I always remember going on one of his airships for the first time. He was so proud of it. After that, I was hooked. I always went up whenever I could, and for a child, there was no better way to travel. As airships got bigger, the more weight or passengers they could carry. And airships began to take to the skies as passenger-carrying airlines. The ships had passenger promenade decks, luxury cabins, and full restaurant facilities. Thousands of passengers were now being carried thousands of miles, all with a perfect safety record. By 1910, a network of German cities had agreed to build airship sheds at their own expense, from which the lines could operate as passenger terminals. There were also vast improvements made in the design of the hangars, with folding doors being fitted, which would roll back safely against the hangar walls. By 1914, the Zeppelin was to pass another test, this time in a military role. Throughout the First World War, Zeppelins were used as bombers, and also for air reconnaissance not only by the Germans, but also by Britain, France, and America. Count von Zeppelin died in March 1917, but Hugo Eckner continued with his dream. Although the possibility of Zeppelin constructing or flying another airship seemed unlikely. The Allies had ordered the destruction of all airship sheds in Germany. However, in a post-war reparation agreement, Zeppelin constructed an airship for America. The LZ-126, which became the Los Angeles, was built at Zeppelin's shed in Friedrichshafen, and then flown by Ekna across to America in 1924. It was this ship that saved the Zeppelin company from extinction and started an industry of airship construction in the United States. Whilst Eckener was busy fundraising for Zeppelin in America and wooing support for his industry, the world's interest in airships shifted towards the North Pole. This was an era when explorers were seeking to reach inaccessible places on the planet. In May 1926, Umberto Nobile, an Italian airshipman, along with an American Ellsworth, joined the famous Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen, in a daring attempt to fly across the Polar Sea. Beaten by only four days to be the first aircraft to do so, the Norge seen here taking off from Kings Bay 
near Spitsbergen, successfully became the first airship to reach the North Pole. And 46 hours later, after a hazardous flight through fog, snow and blinding winds, she landed safely in Alaska. In 1928, the Zeppelin Company launched their most ambitious project yet, the most successful airship in history, the Graf Zeppelin. Hugo Eckener invites you on board. I want to send a greeting to my numerous friends and invite them to take a trip with me over the beautiful Switzerland. Eckener stated that the magnificent Graf Zeppelin was not only an airship in which one could fly, but also an airship in which one could voyage. On her seventh flight, the Graf Zeppelin took 20 fair-paying passengers across the Atlantic. They landed at Lakehurst, New Jersey. The next challenge was to circumnavigate the world. And this airship, the largest in the world, was the first to do so in less than two weeks. Germany, after 25 years of building rigid airships, had finally achieved the dream that von Zeppelin had set out in 1900. A ship that would eventually carry thousands of passengers, majestic and in absolute luxury on long voyages throughout the world. The Graf Zeppelin is just such an airship. In March 1936, a new airship rolled out from the sheds at Friedrichshafen, the Hindenburg. In May 1936, she went into service, and between then and October of that year, the Hindenburg covered no less than 10 transatlantic round trips between Frankfurt and Lakehurst. She also completed several round trips to South America. This was the airship of all airships, a flying hotel carrying 72 passengers and more than 30 crew. She was immense. In fact, only 70 feet shorter than the Titanic. Here at last was the airship of von Zeppelin's and Hugo Eckerner's dreams. Besides passengers and mail, the Hindenburg also carried cargo in her hold. Anything from livestock to heavy machinery to automobiles and even aircraft. In 1936, she covered 200,000 miles, carried 3,000 passengers, and 41,000 pounds of mail and freight. She never once missed a scheduled flight, and never once had to abandon a flight or turn back. The Germans and Zeppelin had now demonstrated to the world that the commercial rigid airship was a viable and extremely comfortable method of travel. At $400 for a one-way ticket, or $720 for a return, this method of travel was far beyond the wallet of the average person, but nevertheless, flights were constantly fully booked, long in advance, and for the first time, the airline business was starting to break even. Noiseless and vibrationless, the airships provided the ultimate in oceanic travel. So quiet and so smooth, in fact, that passengers would often miss the takeoff, thinking the ship was still on the ground. One American newspaper referred to the Hindenburg as a galleon of the air. So stable was the Hindenburg in flight that a game was played to see how long one could stand a pencil on end without it falling over. But eventually, it once got tired of waiting. Even when passing through stormy weather, nobody got airsick on the Hindenburg. A far cry from today's jumbo jets. She was far faster than the steamships, far more regular in schedules, and even more important, a rigid airship appeared to be safe. The age of airship travel had truly arrived, and at the time, it seemed years away before any heavier-than-air machines would truly be able to compete with these gigantic lords of the sky. There was also a sister ship to the Hindenburg under construction at Zeppelin, the LZ-130, and furthermore, there was an even bigger airship now on the drawing boards, the LZ-131. The LZ-130 became the Graf Zeppelin II, which had a short and uneventful career. 
the LZ-131 never got much further than the drawing board. At the Lakehurst Navy base in New Jersey, site of the Hindenburg's demise, American Hank Applegate is an expert on Zeppelins. This hangar houses a replica of the control gondola of the Hindenburg. This was used on the feature-length movie produced in 1975, a film which supported the theory of sabotage. We are in the replica of the Hindenburg gondola. This was a movie set made by David Wise for Universal Pictures uh, for the movie The Hindenburg starring George Scott. This is the control for the steering mechanism to go left and right. It was connected by chain and wires to the fins to the rear of the ship. This controlled the left to right movement. Over here, the elevator controlman would control the direction, the up and the down position of the ship, again through chain and rods. In this position here, this is control the hydrogen valving These gauges indicated how much hydrogen was in each gas cell. This was a master control to open all the gas cells at the same time. This is the navigation room of the Hindenburg. And the charts were here. This is the chart tables, uh, the navigation equipment. This was a sight gauge to check the drift of the ship. And over here, we had the telephone switchboard, which allowed the control car to talk to different functions within the Hindenburg itself. Further back, we have the officer's lounge. Uh, don't sit there right now. It's kind of dirty. But we do have the ladder that went up into the superstructure, into the passenger. No expense department. had been spared on the accommodation and facilities for the passenger's comfort. Ironically, it was the Nazi party who came up with the money to complete the construction of the Hindenburg. And despite Hugo Eckener's opposition and protests, she and the Graf Zeppelin inevitably became identified as symbols of Hitler's new regime. The flag of the Zeppelin airline even bore the Nazi swastika, as did the ship's two giant tail fins. The first use of the ships for propaganda purposes came as early as March 1936, prior to her first flights with passengers. Both the Hindenburg and the Graf Zeppelin appeared over every German city with a population of more than 100,000 people, dropping campaign leaflets and broadcasting from loudspeakers in support of Hitler's recent occupation of the Rhineland. In August, the Hindenburg also appeared over the opening ceremonies of the Berlin Olympics, and in September, flew over the Nazi party rally at Nuremberg. However, despite these airships being used for propaganda purposes by Goebbels, other members of Hitler's hierarchy had no such passion for airships. Goering, the Nazi air minister, was one such person. He felt that they were outdated, and whilst they still served a purpose in peacetime, especially with war approaching, which disguised as symbols of peace between nations, they were to be used for electronic surveillance. However, they would serve absolutely no purpose whatsoever once war came, being too slow and easily shot down by the enemy. He also felt that they were a complete waste of resources and the materials could be far better used on building aircraft. But for Zeppelin, it was a different story. They were now discussing an ambitious 10-year plan to build a fleet of 40 airships such as the Hindenburg, operating a global regular passenger service by 1945, with new terminals being built at Frankfurt, which was to become the Hindenburg's home, and another commercial airship port being planned in America, which was due to soon come under construction. Zeppelin with Hugo Eckener seemed to be the unchallenged master of the skies.
Over the winter of 1936-1937, the Hindenburg underwent some modifications in preparations for her 1937 season. Ten more cabins were fitted. Since the ship had originally been designed for helium, she could carry the extra weight. With the work started on the new ships and the refitting of the Hindenburg, the Zeppelin works had never been so busy. By May 1937, she was ready to begin her new series of flights across the Atlantic. Eighteen flights to Lakehurst had been scheduled. She had already made one round-trip flight to Rio earlier in the spring. The passengers found the accommodation on board was now even more spacious and luxurious than before. We are here in the Zeppelin Museum in Friedrichshafen in the main Zeppelin Hall. We are underneath the reconstruction of LZ-129 Hindenburg. We built this model to the exact same blueprints as used on the original one. It was constructed to show visitors to our museum what life was like on board, one of the great Zeppelins at that time. This is the place where passengers would have boarded, just as you would with a jumbo jet today, up these steps to the passenger accommodation on the A-deck above us. They would pass B-deck, which housed the crew quarters, up some stairs to A-deck, which is the leisure area. This is where the guests relaxed and were provided with coffee or champagne. Whatever they wished, the crew were very courteous. This is the promenade deck, where the passengers could get a magnificent view of the scenery passing by below them. This is the reading and writing room, just as you would find in any grand hotel. Across the other side, you would find the dining areas and sleeping accommodation. These stairs also come up from B-deck. And the passenger cabins are all located to the left and right-hand side of this corridor. Again, everything is just as it was in 1937. Here we have a cabin which has been made ready by the crew for the night. Each one has a double berth, one on top of the other. During the day, these would be folded away. Here you can see an original lightweight aluminium bed ladder. This, of course, is the wash basin, made of an early type of plastic, again to save weight and space. This also could be folded away. This is how the passengers lived on board, the LZ-129 Hindenburg, all those years ago. The passengers would spend most of their time on A-deck, eating and drinking in one of the public rooms. Alfred Grotzinger worked in the kitchen on the Hindenburg. Well, we started with the breakfast, which was American-style. Soft drinks, everything which was available, coffee, tea, hot chocolate, juices, orange juice, everything was fresh. Don't forget, canned drinks weren't available at that time. Then we served cold cuts of meat, toast, butter, different types of eggs to choose from. Well, that was breakfast for the passengers, and then came the lunch. Lunch was, well, each day there was a different soup as a first course. Then we served a meat dish with vegetables and salad, then a dessert, and if the passengers wanted it, coffee and mocha afterwards. In the afternoon, there would be coffee and cakes and sandwiches. In fact, anything they wanted, we would try and provide. In the evening, we would serve dinner, starting with something like fresh lobster, and shrimps and other appetizers. Then again, another meat dish, complete with vegetables and salad. 
We even had 24-hour room service and served sandwiches all night. But this didn't get used too much because the passengers never really got too much of an appetite. There was no exercise for them, you see. The whole business of food was more or less for fun, the whole eating business. And this is still common on ships. It's really to stop boredom. Unlike today's air travel, where the meals are already prepared and cooked, we didn't have any ready-made foods with us. We had to prepare and cook everything. More or less everything was fresh. We also had very limited space to work in. The kitchen was very small and the cooker only had four cooking rings. We had to carefully plan everything as to how we would get everything ready at once. The cooking rings were electric. These had one big disadvantage. They had an automatic safety shut-off in case they overheated. So if we had to cook on them for a long time or maybe cook something very hot like steaks, it often used to happen that during lunch preparation or dinner, the automatic shut-off would come in and turn off all the power. That used to happen quite often and would be a problem for us. But I don't think the passengers ever knew. When the Hindenburg left Germany for its first transatlantic trip to Lakehurst in 1937, Hugo Eckener was not on board. Never could he have imagined such a tragic ending to his dream. She took off from Frankfurt on the morning of May the 3rd. There had been a bomb threat the previous day, but this and the numerous threats that had been previously received were not taken seriously and had never amounted to anything more. During the flight, the Hindenburg encountered severe headwinds and these added an extra half day or more to her flying time before landing in Lakehurst. On the morning of May the 6th, Max Bruss, commanding the Hindenburg, had radioed ahead that instead of the scheduled 6 a.m. arrival, they should expect them around 6 p.m. The Hindenburg was by now passing over the coast of Maine. At noon, she flew over the city of Boston. She was nearing her journey's end. She had made up some time, and Captain Bruss indicated that he would now be over the landing field at 4 p.m. However, there was a storm blowing up ahead, and this would catch them just as they approached Lakehurst. Eugen Bentele was a crew member on the Hindenburg during that flight. The flight from Frankfurt to New York was pretty normal. We were a few hours late because there was a heavy headwind. Nevertheless, we did the obligatory flight around the skyscrapers in Manhattan. The New Yorkers, who you would think are used to anything, used to look up in amazement as we went by the skyscrapers, and the ships would all sound their horns. Having cleared New York by 4 p.m., the Hindenburg was over Lakehurst. Although a crowd had gathered, the ground crew were not standing by. The weather had worsened and the Hindenburg circled the airfield and flew off towards the New Jersey coastline. A few hours later, it was considered clear enough to land. And so in we flew, about 70 meters from the ground, and the holding team were assembled below us. During a storm, or if the atmosphere is not quite right, we don't try and land by ourselves at this point. We drop the landing ropes from the bow, and the holding team will try to pull the ship down. John Iannacone was one of the landing crew on duty at Lakehurst that day. 
He watched the Hindenburg make her final approach. And it stopped raining, and it, and it was starting to clear up. And the first thing, first thing you know, the ship went on by us and came back again on the, on the second time. And that's when she proceeded to make her landing. When, uh, when she got over the ground crew, it seemed to like, like uh, uh, the, uh, the wind had died down and the people, uh, the airship dropped their two landing lines and the ground crew had a hold of them. And uh, that's when uh, I noticed a, a big red glow just forward of the, of the top fin. The landing seemed as usual. We didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. We had often flown through thunderstorms and there had never been a problem. We had never had any problems or calamities with the Hindenburg. As we were about to come into land, six men were ordered up into the bow section. This again is normal to distribute the weight. Since I was free and didn't have to prepare food, I went forward and headed to the bow section. On the way forward, I noticed an air valve, which was to remain open, with the fresh air coming in. I thought this would be a good place to sit, so I sat down on one of the girders. I looked down. Suddenly there was a very strong shock going through the ship. I could see people below me running away. I thought, what has happened? Perhaps one of the landing ropes broke free or something like that. But then I looked above me and couldn't believe what I saw above my head. Fire. towards it, we saw one man jump out of the nose, and of course, uh, the fire came out of there like a blowtorch, and it didn't hit him, but the man that stayed in the ship, he got burnt from, uh, from the top of his head to his, to his uh, feet, and all, all he had on was the shoes. Everything was burnt off. The back touched the ground first, because the gas burnt there first. Then the whole framework just folded together. The actual crash was not that hard, but we were tipping up at a very steep angle, and I was thrown out over past one of the engines. I just missed one of the propellers as I flew over the engine. It was still turning. I remember. And then I blacked out. When I came to, I instinctively ran away from the ship, although I was in a complete daze. Then I realized my back was burning. In fact, it was my overalls. They were on fire. I just thought I had better get off the ship. I thought that I would wait for the gondola to hit the ground and then try and jump off. I cannot remember now how I did get off. It just seems to me that I blacked out and then fell through never-ending space. I do remember thinking this was the end. But then I was lucky. I hit sand. It was soft. I managed to get to my feet and run away. All of my friends who were up on a higher level than me on A-deck lost their lives. The 
die sind alle ums Leben gekommen. Und äh, ich habe verhältnismäßig also nicht mal so arg viel davon getragen. I was hardly injured, just a few cuts and bruises, but I was taken to hospital. I, I was in a severe state of shock. After he got on the ground, most of us ran towards the ship to see what we could do. And uh, we saw the, a lot of the passengers and part of the crew running out from underneath it. And uh, my, in my particular area, I was, we got close to the ship and we saw an old couple still in, in the ship and we helped them to get out. Also saw the little cabin boy run out from underneath it. He was soaking wet in one of the tanks uh, burst above him and soaked him. And uh, after it hit the ground, we could see him uh, running, running out from underneath it. It was just a, an accident that happened, and uh, if there was, a, if it had used helium, the fire would never happen. Nothing would ever happen to that ship. Was it the hydrogen that caused the accident? Maybe. But what actually started the fire in the first place? One theory was a small time bomb was left in the mail, which contained a photo flash bulb on a timer, enough to spark off the fire. As the flames burnt well into the night, newsreel cameras had been there to record every second of the disaster. It was a miracle that anyone could have survived this. Whatever the cause, 35 passengers had perished in the flames. The injured were ferried to hospital, many of them seriously burnt, some of them beyond recognition. Captain Pruss was one such unfortunate victim. Among the survivors were these crew members, including the young cabin boy Werner Franz, who escaped without a scratch. As the coffins of the dead were laid out ready for their final journey back to Germany, thousands of people turned out to pay their last respects. Many raised their arms in the Nazi salute. Others just laid flowers and left messages of condolences. Whilst the coffins were loaded onto a steamship en route for Germany, the remaining survivors watched in silence. This was the harsh reality of the Hindenburg disaster. A twisted, tangled mass of scorched girders and a few shreds of blackened fabric this is all that remained of the once proud and mighty German airliner, the Hindenburg, as it lay on the field at Lakehurst. A naval inspection board, headed by one Captain Haynes, inspected the wreckage, in the hope that the smouldering ruins might yield a clue as to the cause of the disaster. For Hugo Eckener, this was the end of a dream. A life's work was lying in ruins. Zeppelin airships were finished. Nobody would want to fly in one after this. Eckener believed sabotage to be the cause, but had to publicly retract his statement by the order of Hitler. At the inquiry, Eckener himself, having grounded the rest of the Zeppelin fleet, headed the German delegation. Of course, you will realize yourself that in this moment, as long as investigation is pending, it is impossible, impossible for me to give you any statement or any ideas regarding the causes of the disaster. Scientists at NASA, home of the American space program, have been researching the disaster of the Hindenburg, trying to find a possible cause. Well, here at NASA, uh, basically uh, orchestrated investigation involved a, num a number of investigators from the NASA material science laboratory. To start off with, it was necessary to have samples. I'd like to show you some of the samples that were necessary, and this is from the Hindenburg. Uh, these were recovered at Lakehurst uh, after the accident. Here's another set of samples from the collector in Chicago. Uh, in addition to the Hindenburg samples, also acquired fabric samples from the Graf Zeppelin, the one that was built prior to this, the 127, and also the Graf Zeppelin that was built after the Hindenburg. And we found it, uh, the analysis here was the purpose of that was to get, understand the makeup of the fabric and particularly the doping process because the literature 
was quite unclear as to what airship, uh, what doping process was used on what airship. So the purpose of the, the analysis here was to make that determination and also to get some correlation between the various airships and also some correlation between the samples I have here, which obviously we couldn't uh, put under a destructive type test, but what we call a non-destructive test. And then the samples we used in flame propagation all were used in a destructive manner, but we needed correlation between what we call those shop samples and the actual Hindenburg fabric and doping process. The microscope obviously magnifies the image of the sample that you're looking at uh, many times fold. And it's this, this apparatus then is what identifies the elementary nature of the fabric and particularly the doping process used on the airships. Addison Bain found that remarkably there was a significant difference in the doping process used to seal the Hindenburg than was used in other ships. The fabric was found to contain highly combustible compounds. The same propellants could also be found in rocket fuel. What is done here, now this, is, this particular sample is an LZ sample of fabric. This is the red side with the iron oxide and the aluminumized side on the other side. So what happens is the investigator puts this into the machine. The machine reads that and actually identifies a fingerprint. Every material has its own fingerprint or spectrograph. Both, basically what's being read is the organic structure, uh, the celluloses, the acetates, and uh, that type of compound. Bain also found that this highly flammable material could have been ignited very easily by atmospheric or static electricity. What you saw there was about 30,000 volts. According to Professor Dykeman, who was the static electricity and lightning expert back in 1937, who testified at the Board of Inquiry, predicted that at the height of the Hindenburg at Lakers at that time, that the voltage gradient on the airship was probably on the order of 100,000 volts. It is Bain's belief, following these tests, that the Hindenburg caught fire as a result of static electricity hitting the highly flammable outer fabric of the ship's skin which once burnt through, allowed the hydrogen to ignite. He does not consider the hydrogen to be the cause. I'm hoping that based on my research, the chapter of the Lakers disaster is now closed. All that remains at Lakehurst today of the tragic end of the Hindenburg is a memorial on the exact spot where on May the 6th, 1937, she exploded in a ball of flame and fell almost gently to earth. A disaster that was to be captured forever on the newsreels throughout the world as one of this century's greatest disasters. <laughs>